You're welcome back to the pause right here on Joy News. Of course, you can join with your comments or questions via social media handles. My name is Alton Bob, and I'll let's start from the streets. And this afternoon, the message has been very clear since morning. Hands off our hotel. And that is the message coming from uh, to that Greek minister, Brian de Champon, from scores of Ghanaians who have who poured onto the streets of Accra, singing patriotic songs to demand an immediate halt in the sale of the majority of snitch stick in four hotels to Rock City Hotel, which he owns. Now, we'll take you to the ground shortly for, the, for all the action that you may have missed. Right now, though, let's take a look at what they are fighting for. And of course, so the aggrieved protesters say they will push until the deal is completely off. Uh, Master Lagbagba is with them, and earlier on, he spoke to the General Secretary of the end, is the Fivi Fiabekwete, about why the need for the demonstration after all. Uh, what could it be except a lot of sadness uh, that our country has come to, to this? Uh, we reach a place where there's virtually only insensitivity at the highest level, uh, only corruption, only greed, only selfishness. And uh, leadership is supposed to be to work for the people, but what we have in place now is simply leadership that thinks about itself and thinks very little about the people. I mean, that's where we have come. Do you think this protest um, is going to change anything? The importance of protests is to just ensure that the people rally against what is wrong. The outcomes of it are not always in your control. But history must have it recorded that the people of Ghana rose up against what they considered to be a lot of insensitivity, a lot of greed, a lot of selfishness. And that is what matters, really. We know that um, many have described this protest as non-partisan. The NDC has thrown its weight um, behind the um, organizers. But a question many Ghanaians keep asking, if the, if the, scripts, if the, if the script is flipped, and the NDC is on the other side. Are you still going to maintain this position? What is right just has to be right. You see, the point is that we need to read that state where patriots just have to fight for what is right. It's really a shame that uh, MPP will say all that they have said, get into power and do the very opposite. And, uh, and I can tell you that within my own party, it is very loud and clear. So that's the General Secretary of the NDC, Fifi Kwete. And we have more from you on the demonstration that started this morning from the Labadi Beach Hotel and ended at the Chrysler Ken Parish Hall, not far from the Jubilee House. But if you have not been following developments so far, let's take a look at what they have been fighting for this morning. And, and, and of course, uh, the SNIT asset sale, the brand of Champon. So SNIT selling 60% stake in some four hotels. Why? And... They, they want to develop hotels in the world-class standard. They think that they don't have uh, the, the capital to develop it to the state that they want. The reason why they want to sell 60% of their stake in these four hotels so that the investor can inject some capital into the running of these four hotels. Also, assist in the management of the hotels in question. And so the hotels, uh, these are hotels owned by SNITs. We have the Nabadi Beach Hotel located in Accra. It's a five-star leisure hotel. It's been around for some time now, and it has 164 rooms. We also have the La Palm Oya Beach Hotel. Not just, I mean, they actually they virtually share a wall with the Labadi Beach, the Labadi Beach Hotel, also located here in Accra. It's a four-star hotel with 152 rooms. We have the Elmina Beach Resort located at Elmina. It's a, it's a three-star hotel with 100 rooms. There's also Ridge Royale. I mean, built in 2016, new if you like, located in Cape Coast, one of the prime areas in Cape Coast. It's a three-star hotel with 79 rooms. They, all, we, they are also looking to, you know, offload 60% shares in the Buzia Beach Hotel, located at Buzia, three-star hotel with 62 rooms. And of course, Trust Lodge Hotel at Takrade, a purpose-built hospitality block structure with just 10 rooms. So these are the hotels that's net sales. I mean, I mean, they need capital injection. For that reason, they are selling off 60% of their stake. So sale of Sin Hotel, criteria for strategic investment. This is what they advertise before they settle on Rock City Hotel. Relevant credential in hotel industry, sources of proof of funding, experience in owning hotels, experience in managing hotels, and of course, experience 
in development of real estates. These were some of the criteria that they put forth when they advertised for people to express interest in, the, uh, in their intention to sell off 60% stake in the uh, hotels that I mentioned. So in 2018, the search for a transaction advisor began. In January 2019, six out of the 15 firms shortlisted and issued with an RFPF. And in February 2022, a search for a strategic partner also began. And in March 2022, according to SNIT, nine companies sent proposals for consideration by the advisor uh, for selection of a strategic partner to, you know, to, to take over the 60% shares, shares in the hotel. And so all of six hotels are all in the same financial position and should not be uh, sold together. These are uh, concerns of organized labor. And they are also of the view that the proposal to sell six hotels has now been reduced to four. So the process is now in void. And uh, of course, organized labor also says that the proposed payment terms are different from what was agreed with the transaction advisor. Remember that organized labor, they have four members representing them on the board of SNITs, but they claim that they are in the minority when it comes to decision making. But these are the concerns they raised uh, somewhere that got President Akufari interested and directed that they, they, they look up, the, the Labor Ministry, you know, investigate whatever concerns that they had. It's unclear the decision going for regarding that. So they also raised issue about due diligence not done and state properties should not be sold to a minister of state where they brought in the issue of conflict of interest and of course, state, 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 state capture in their own words. And, and, and according to them, this is simply a state capture. So uh, these are some of the concerns raised by the Trade Union Congress. So let's focus on the, on, on, the, on the hotel or the organization that is almost at the end of it and taking 60% stake in these four hotels. And it's Rock City uh, Hotel, uh, as, as maybe our were is owned by the Food and Agriculture Minister, Brian Echampo. He is the sole owner of this hotel. Construction of Roxy started in 2008, and the hotel partially opened in 2019. The hotel has been, has been in operation for approximately five years, and it boasts of over 600 rooms, making one of the biggest, if not the biggest hotel in Ghana. Now, there's ongoing expansion that will result in Rock City Hotel becoming one of the largest hotels in Africa with about 2,200 rooms and is located at Impraeso in the eastern region. So, Bernard Champon says that he owns the, the company and because of his role as a public servant, as the Minister of State responsible for the food and agriculture sector, he now holds a non-executive directorship of Rock City Hotel. He says, I'm not part of the functioning role of the company I do not occupy any office in a company that conflicts with my ministerial roles as per the constitution. But what is clear is that he is 100% he is owned. He's a beneficial owner of the hotel, if you like. And so, SNIT financial performance surplus deficit at year end. So, this is how it's been. So, for example, in, in 2013, uh, SNIT itself, uh, in terms of its financial performance, you realize that they were on a path of growth between 2013, 2014, 2015, and then recorded negative 364 million. 2016, it will improve in 2017 at 131 million, but will come down again uh, to 442 million, uh, repeated 475 million, went up to 588 in 2020, and now, uh, as at the last count in 2021, SNET is actually. Recording a loss, recorded a loss of 301 million uh, Ghana cities. So these are the facts, and of course you can uh, you can make your own mind as to whether the hotels deserve to go into private hands or need to pump more resources into it. But so since morning, the group led by the member of parliament for North Town, Samuel Kujeto Ablakwa, and some members of the minority and in parliament, the Trade Union Congress, and some interest group joined and it started from the Labadi Beach Hotel and ended at the Christ the King Price were not far from the Jubilee House. And this was an the agreement they had with the police before the commencement of the demonstration. My colleague, Maswell Agbaba, marched with the protesters and now joins me for an episode. So, Maswell, I want to, I want to uh, assume that everything is now over. So, let's listen to Maswell after 
uh, uh, the demonstration came to a halt at the Christ the King Parish Hall, not far from the Jubilee House. Pouring a libation. Let's try and see if we can speak to. Um, hello, sir. Welcome to Joy News. Uh, sir, your name? Okay. He's unable to speak to us at this point. Um, but information that I gathered from some of the people here um, is that he's one of the traditional priests here in the La community. And that libation was purposely. Um, against what he describes as state capture. He talks about the illegitimate takeover of their lands. Okay, great. Okay, great, the sir. President of uh, what's your name, sir? My name is Dr. Ishmael Mi Amano Dodu. Okay, um, I'm sure you know the chief priest is here. Yes. It's the Lakaulomo. Lakaulomo is the, is the Lakaulomo for, for the entire La, 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 La Kotoko area. Okay. And uh, I'm the president of the Ghana Dami Alliance for Change. And we are standing for the social transformation of the Ghana Dami people. Okay. What we Tell are, us, what was the purpose of that libation? Well, what we was saying was that the girls should, should ask anyone who is stolen the land, who is, who is cheating the Ghana Dami people, who has forcibly stolen our alloyed properties, they should, they should come and answer. So it's almost like a curse. And he actually threw down the, 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 the bottle, the shrimp bottle, mm. to, to invoke a curse on anyone who continuously steals from the land, land community. Wow, so that's why he broke the bottle? That's why he broke the bottle. Traditionally, it's a signification. Okay. And it is a very, very bad omen if that should happen in libation pouring. Yeah. From, Tell me, you are the president of the, you say you are the president? Gandangi Alliance for Change. Gandangi Alliance yes. for Change. Tell me, you are an indigent. Tell me, how exactly do you feel um, by this? Um, his actions, how exactly do you feel as a Gan? As a Gan do you, person, do you Do you um, I would, associate? I would, certainly, I would certainly tell you that uh, what has happened to the Gan Adangbe people is one that is not just disheartening, but very, very wicked and dangerous for us. We are looking at a, a group of people who have given so much for the formation of the Republic of Ghana. Look at all the lands that we gave for the formation of the capital. And then let me tell you something. By 2030, the World Bank 
predict that the GDP of Greater Accra will be $30 billion, of which, if you cast your eyes on all the youth, youth that are here, lack of skills, lack of education, how are we positioning them to be able to benefit from the a GDP of Greater Accra region of $30 billion USD? We are talking about a community where our schools have been destroyed, a school, our, our polyclinics have been destroyed, the Salaga market has been destroyed, all the places where we can make economic fortune will be destroyed. Our women are on the street. They are joining us today when they should be selling at Kwasiadraso, Katamanto, Salaga market or Makola. Why are they doing this? They are fighting for the future generation of Ghan people. Listen, whenever the Ghan Adangwe community write exams, anyone who is a Ghan Adangwe person, there's 98% chances that that person may not make it to SHS. Why? Because the schools are not well equipped for them. We have a lot of illiteracy. So, what are we going to do to leave them out of poverty? The urban poverty the Ghans are suffering from is one that is very catastrophic. And until a deliberate attempt is made to leave the Ghans out of poverty, is going to be challenging. What the Ghans need is some form of a development authority that would look at their development plans, the type of schools they need, access to that school, the quality of the school, the health clinic that they need, and they should be paid property taxes so they can underwrite the, the expenditures for all this. Gans needs representation in universities. We need representation in polyclinics. We need representation in, in high levels of, of, pub, of, of public policy. Gan people need representation in security. We need representation everywhere because we are the Alodia landowners. What you are seeing today is just the beginning of what could be unleashed if nothing, nothing is done about the situation of Ghan people. All these things you say, yes. um, how are they um, connected um, to the uh, the alleged sale of these four hotels to um, a great minister, Brandy Champons. The uh, alleged Rocky. sale of the four hotels yeah. is sim symptomatic of the deliberate attempt by certain political miscreants to, to ar arrogate the land assets of the people. Now, every community defines themselves by their tribe, by their clan, by their language and their assets. In order to lift people out of poverty, they need to be able to use something to, to benefit them from the four from the productive production, production of, of, of productive factors of economy. Now, this land, the hotels, what, what is important is that the Alodian landowners must be given equity share in this hotel. They, it, there's nothing wrong with giving 30% of the equity shares of all these hotels to the Alodian landowners. And therefore, if you are going to sell it, sit down with them, think about it. Now, what is the benefit to our people? Have you thought about it? Who is going to take over? How much is the hotel sold? What, pro what procurement processes do they follow for a sitting member of parliament and a sitting uh, minister of state to benefit from information that is sacred for anyone to contest for, uh, for procurement processes? This is a violation of ethical rules. And we are saying that, look, the way they, 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 they violated this flanketly is the same way they are taking our lands and our properties. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very welcome. much. Dr. Ishmael Ni Amano Dodu. Dr. Amano Dodu, Dr. 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 Am Amano Dodu Amano president Dodu. of the Gandanga Alliance. Alliance for Change. For change. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank Thanks for talking much. to us. Uh, thanks for talking to us. Uh, he said earlier that he shares the same sentiments as the traditional priest who earlier poured libation right in front of the Labadi Beach Hotel, essentially raining curses on um, people, he said, um, are taking over, unjustifiably taking over Ghana. Lads. Um, politicians he talked about buying state factors. property. Yeah. Honorable Oblakwa, I hand over to you. <laughs> car properties and many um, others. Now we have um, the organizers of the demonstration. They are, going, they are about to address. Please, can we all move this way? They are about to address the crowd before. All those ahead, please come back. They start the journey to the Jubilee House. All those ahead, please come back. Hundreds of people have gathered on the streets in front of the Labadi Beach Hotel. Please, everybody should come back. Come back. We've seen quite a number of policemen also in route control gear. You can see them. <laughs> Also strategically positioned to ensure that there's death rock and this is done in a peaceful manner. 
But what we can report to you is that in the last 30 minutes, we've had traffic building up on this stretch. So on this stretch of road right in front of the Labadi Beach Hotel. Earlier, the police officers were able to control the crowd, getting them off the street. Please, now, everyone should come this way. Come, come this way. Come this way. We now want to address you, show you the route, the number give you the instructions before we can start. We don't want to have any confrontation in this peaceful but important protest. So everyone should come, listen to leadership, what is in this demonstration, then we can all follow suit. So all protestants, please come this way. Please, can we get the other mic for the other van so that the speech can move on? Get us the other mic. In the bed of that pickup truck, about to address the protesters. Oh boy! Yep, from the Member of Parliament, someone put your Arise, Ghana youth, for your country. The nation demands your devotion. Let's all song. unite to uphold and, and make the English stand strong. Arise, Ghana youth, for your country. The nation demands your devotion. Let us all unite to uphold. We are all involved, we are all involved, we are all involved in building our motherland, we are all involved, we are all involved, we are all involved. General Assassini, a yaboard in Dimayen, Mojana and Anutrebu or my soul. Go, General Assassini, a yaboard in Dimayen, Mojana and Anutrebu Yadi to or my yen. me, so me, Yatwasu, Ninja, Oh say, oh say, So our forefather called to put a country called Ghana that we have come to inherit. But today's Ghana leaders want to carry everything into oblivion. So we are here to show that Ghana must live beyond us and our unborn children. This morning, a demonstration initiated by our MP in Parliament for North Town, Honorable Okujato Ablakwa, to protest against the illegal sale of hotels that belong to street payers, pensioners. So we are here and we are happy to have you in our numbers. It's almost 10. We will take short addresses for the leadership for everyone to be in line to understand why you must be part of this protest. So first to speak, I will Interesting invite here. A on representative of this in your Congress, those Hotel. who manages workers Soon, of we'll Ghana. We'll try to get to speak to him, but we have a rep from so I organized labor. Comrade Nayele to speak to us. Choboy! Rep from organized Chaboy. labor. Yeah. Choboy! Choboy! Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for turning out in your numbers. In fact, on the ground, we have such energy. This is about us. This 
is about us and about workers. And when I people asking, oh, is it about this political party or that political party? Excuse me. Excuse me. Snakes and they are It can't work. <laughs> Part of the capital city is currently on lockdown. Part of the capital city is currently on lockdown. This is the pause you're enjoying. We'll take a short break and return with more. Welcome back to the Pulse uh, here on Joy News. And we, we've been bringing you events that happened this morning and ended at the Christ the King Parish, or not far from the Jubilee House, a group led by the minority parliament, some of the Blacker, and some members of the minority took to the streets of Accra, protesting the sale of some hotels belonging to SNIT to the Food and Agricultural Minister's Company, uh, Rock City Hotel. Now, working with them uh, was uh, Madam Susan Setre. Uh, she's with the Trade Union Congress, and she joins us via Zoom. Uh, ma ma Madam Susan, so after the march, what's next? Well, um, I suppose we, um, what we have done is to put out the pe petition or given the petition. All of us were not allowed to go in there, but um, uh, some of the uh, organizers, including uh, Honorable Okujito himself were able to get in to present the petition. Mm. And so um, uh, we have asked, just as organized labor has asked, that uh, this sale, the processes being gone through, must be stopped because the hotels must not be sold out. You know, So if, if there are any issues going forward, I think that whoever is a partner may have to sit and... Um, look at a way forward. So a petition has been presented. We're asking that the sale does not go ahead. Mm. But I, I remember that, I mean, when this matter got to a head and President Kufuado got to know of it, he directed the Minister for Labor, uh, Employment and Labor Relations to sit with TUC to find a way forward. Does, this, does today's uh, March 
suggest that perhaps that, that, that discussion did not go well. That's how come now you have to take your, your, your fight to the public. Well, um, that meeting was hard all right. Mm. And uh, I am sure that if there were any results from the organized labor or even the Honorable Okujeto himself would have put that out, mm. you know. So <laughs> nothing really came out of there of worth for organized labor, mm. you know. And the meetings haven't stopped. So they're going to go. Uh, I understand there's another meeting coming up. You know, and uh, we're asking that the sale must be stopped. You know, and so if we're, if we're not seeing that, if we're not uh, feeling that that is the reason the, uh, the, these discussions are being held, mm. then really we're not making any headway. And I know that you would agree with me that if you went to a negotiation table and you didn't see your way clear, that would be a deadlock. And that's exactly what uh, uh, came out. So, well, there's another meeting. Maybe um, organized labor may get some responses from there or some good results from there. But as it is, no. But so, so, so tell me, what, what really is your issue here? Is it the fact that the 60% the, the shares that SNIT is seeking to offload is going to someone who served in the government? Or the fact that you don't want this to happen at all? Oh, I thought that I thought that our issues are overflowed, really. I mean, we've said it time and again that um, uh, uh, these hotels that apparently are doing well, you know, must not be sold. And, uh, and that's it. And for us, there's also an issue with the individual buying the uh, so-called ailing uh, 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 Hotels. state entity. Mm. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, we think that it amounts to state capture. We think that if a hotel is doing well and apparently uh, being sold off, then it's questionable. So for us, these are the issues. And we think that the sale must not go ahead, mm. must not go ahead because these, you know, injunctions were raised by representatives of organized labor, even there on the SNED board at 2018 when these issues were first presented. Mm. So uh, I think that they're overflowed. <laughs> the whole Ghana must know why um, labor is saying no. And too often for me as an individual, and this is very personal to me, mm. I think if there's um, a problem with uh, the management of SNITs, that issue itself must be looked at. You know, we, we have so many issues, especially also with the Act 766, mm. you know. Yeah. And so, I mean, all those issues need to be ironed out. And this is one major issue that for me, I am happy about because especially in the divestiture of Ghana's um, industries, really nothing have come out mm. of those as far as I'm, I mean, I'm not too old, but <laughs> I think that if you look at the history and you look at the uh, information, nothing has come out of divestiture. And so this is also just going to be uh, going that way, I mean, for all we know. So we are saying that the hotels must not be sold which is why we would again agree to go into a meeting at the behest of the president, mm. you know, because we must have results. And we're not going to go into the meeting to be told, oh, let's look at the processes. What can we do just so the sale goes ahead? Because organized labor says we don't want the sale. Mm. We're also, you know, uh, 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 contributors to SNIT, just like at this you know, and workers are going with uh, home with too little. But but at the meeting, did, did, did you get the impression that I mean, th th there was to be a halt in the entire process? Because from what we are picking, it, it looks like they are almost at the end of it. Well, that's what we understand. But we're saying it mustn't go ahead. Well, there are many processes available to uh, uh, to. The, the partners or the entities that are doing the negotiations. I wasn't directly in that meeting, mm. but then the information 
uh, um, outflow or that came out of that meeting was that, well, we didn't see our way clear and uh, not much for us, not much came out of that meeting. And some, and, and some will say that perhaps, I mean, the concerns that we are raising now is rather coming in rather too late. We are too late to the party because the process didn't start in 2024. It started some time back. Uh, they advertise in some of the dailies. The process to select a strategic a, a, a investor went through due process. We didn't, we, we didn't raise the concerns at that time. You are not raising it now when they are almost at the end of it. And TUC has yeah. four, 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 four persons on the board. See, you see, it, well, those four representatives are organized labor representatives, not just the TUC. Right. But then the thing is, we keep saying that this issue, maybe we should have, uh, you know, gone on demonstration. What are people saying from 2018 when our representatives protested? Oh, you, you can't hit the streets immediately. I think that you would want as much as possible to look at how the matter is progressing. Yes. They may have put it in the public domain and uh, whatever processes may have been gone through. But you know, some of these things, you actually, uh, uh, you don't get the information mm. that you want or you don't get all the information until at the point when you realize, no, this thing is not like the way we think it should be. Because when you look at the Labadi Beach Hotel, for example, mm. what we're being told about it, apparently it's making profits. Yes. You know, and it's making good profits. Mm. You know, so so why sell it on when it's it's giving you good money, when it's able to pay its taxes, when it's able to uh, from information from the registrar generals, you know, the profits that they are uh, uh, registering there, you know, it's good profit. Mm. So why would you want to sell that off? Why? And and it doesn't make sense to us. You know, so those are some of the reasons why we are. So it's not as if we have sat down. We have protested from day one. And honestly, organized labor alone wouldn't have been able to stop this. You know that, don't you? How many, how many people are there in organized labor? How many? Of course, labor can, you know, bring this country to a halt. But we need everybody. You, every Ghanaian worker. We need everybody. We need everybody because SNAIT is about all of us. We're all going to go to, on pension one day or another you know so this is about all of us and not just a few politicians or a few that you think are in uh, the, the the unions the traditional unions etc you know so all of us must be interested in this because it concerns all of us if you are a worker and your 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 family maybe your mother your father may have gone on retirement your brother your sister a cousin you know obviously there is somebody who is still in the world, world of work that you must be concerned about, you know. So, and so exactly, this is really and, about... And, 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 and this brings me to my next question, of course, that, that the final question for you this afternoon. It's about the management of SNIT itself. I mean, this is just one aspect of it, but the management of SNIT itself, I mean, and the concern that I, my, I contribute to SNIT, I should be concerned about uh, how SNIT will be able to pay my pension when I eventually retire, and that has been, a, a, I mean, a bigger concern. The management of it itself, what more should be done? As we take a look at these hotels, what more do you think should be done in terms of, you know, getting SNIT to run properly? Me, I, I think that this is very personal to me, and I've said that from day one. Mm. I think that if we have a problem with the management of SNIT, we should look at it. Mm. You know, if it's uh, a management that is not managing well, of course. Maybe they have an issue. The reason why they're not able to, they should be able to lay it bare. You know, if they're not able to, and we, we realize that that is a, a, a management which is doing well, but then they don't have whatever tools or support, then we look at that. But if we think that things are not going well, because look, the, the, the issues with SNED are too many for me. Mm. You sit in the office and somebody calls, I just started my retirement and this is what I'm getting, and that is actually said when they did my calculation, this is what I'm getting. So for me, as an individual, because I'm also a contributor to pensions in this country, you know, if management is not managing well, hey. Well, I think we have, we, we, we've lost uh, Madam Susan Setre, but she is with the Trade Union Congress, and she was one of those that took part in the demonstration this morning. That ended at the Christ the King Parish Hall, not far from the Jubilee House. And so 
uh, we will stay with this issue a little longer because my colleague, Masa Lagbaba, who worked with them from Labadi Beach all the, all the way to the class, I, I can imagine how many, uh, how, how many steps you've taken today and how many fats you've burned. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of kilometers. Mm. Um, when we got to the um, Bema Camp area, the Gifford Road, we left with about 3.2 kilometers to wow. get to the terminating point. Mm. Ah, quite difficult, but we still had to soldier on because right. um, you know, we want to hear the concerns of the people. Mm. And eventually, um, that's what happened. That's what we got. Um, quite at the, at the terminating point, um, I mean, it was peaceful. It was all peaceful throughout. Um, we didn't have any disturbances you know, um, there. But getting to the terminating point, that was when there was a near scaffold. There was actually a scaffold between the police um, and the protesters who actually wanted to get closer to, um, to the Jubilee House. So um, the North Tongue member of parliament, Samuel Kujitua Blako, who's been leading this campaign, um, tells me that the agreement with the Ghana Police Service was to terminate um, at the Christ the King Parish. But what happened was that um, they had to end the protest um, about 100 meters away from the Christ the King Parish. And that was what um, some of the protesters were not happy about. So there was a, there was a two layer of um, security preventing um, the protesters. There was the first layer of um, the barricades, the mm. police barricades. And then the police also formed a strong human wall that nobody could jump. Mm. Um, so some of the protesters actually attempted jumping those, those two layer security that they put in place. And then um, some people were pepper sprayed actually. At, yeah. at, at the place? Yeah, at, at the protest. Some people were pepper sprayed. And, um, um, and the protesters were not happy, you know, with that. So some of them started throwing their placards, you know, into the, I mean, into the police service who, who were there, started throwing their placards. And, um, yeah, they were pepper sprayed. Um, I'm told, the Northern Member of Parliament tells me that some of them were taken to the 37 military hospital at the time that we were leaving. Um, he For said, the reaction of the police? Yes. He said they were going to visit um, those who have been taken to the hospital. And he says that um, Parliament will take a strong view of what happened. Um, how come some of the protesters were pepper sprayed, you know, um, at the demonstration? But for that, it was largely peaceful, peaceful. you know, from the, from the starting point to the terminating point. It was largely peaceful. So, so they handed a petition to the presidency and yeah. it was received by the... One of the deputy uh, chief of staff at, yeah. the, at the Jubilee House. Yes. So it's a... 15-point petition, mm -hmm. and, um, and Samuel Kujitua Blackwa took his time um, to read all of that. Key amongst um, some of the demands is, one, first of all, they should completely eliminate this deal off the table. And um, they say there's no two ways about it. Um, they are very clear in their demand, very emphatic, mm -hmm. in their demands that this deal should be off the table. Mm -hmm. And they make the point that if it's not taken off the table, they have all options available to them. They're going to you're going to use, first of all, we know that um, the, 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 he has petition strategy. Yes, and you know? there's also a private member's motion that you seek. Exactly, exactly. He tells us that um, on the petition to Shraj, um, Shraj has actually invited all the people who matter in this case, um, you know, to come so that they start, you know, the conversations and start investigations, you know, into the matter. Um, second, demands they are second demand they are making also is for President Ekufuado um, to support a bill that bans all government appointees from buying states, um, state assets. Mm. Um, another demand that they're making is for um, President Kufuado to sack all government appointees who are on the state board, who are part of the state management, who he says are complicit you know, mm. um, in this deal. So from the 15 bulleted points and demands, um, these are some of the key ones that we can... You know, we can and, 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 and was there a response from the presidency on this? As far as yes. the person who picked the, yes. the, the um, petition? Yes, yeah, so we had the deputy um, chief of staff um, who represented one of them and who represented. Mm. And he said... Um, that, Adumwa Bosman. Yeah, and he said he's happy, he's excited that it was largely peaceful. Uh, we didn't have any disturbances. Um, um, and he commended the protesters for um, respecting the rules and um, yeah, following the guidelines from the police service. Um, he says... He's taking the petition, he's taking delivery of the petition, he'll send it to the president and hopefully uh, they'll get a good response and mm. when the response comes, they'll definitely communicate back to the organizers of the demonstration. Uh, so now beyond today, they are looking at the, the, the strike investigation. Exactly. And then the private members motion in parliament as their next step. As their next step. And um, they also want the deal completely off the, the mm. table. And they make the point that if, the, if they go ahead, if SNIP goes ahead with this deal, 
if push comes to shove, um, if push comes to shove, they would even match to the Labadi Beach Hotel and the La Palm um, Hotel, block the access to um, those places. If this deal goes through mm -hmm. and they don't hit their demands, all of these options are available to them and they'll be, they'll be forced to use them. Master, thank you very much for thank you that good job you've done today. Yeah. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll take you to the court because the court is on recess. Uh, businessman Richard Jakpa is scheduled to, is, is already undergoing cross examination by the Attorney General's office. We'll tell you what has happened so far uh, as we bring the very latest from the court. Welcome back to the polls here on Joyner. Another matter that is of so much you know, public interest, if you like, is this ambulance trial that is ongoing in the court. The minority leader in parliament is the first accused, Dr. Casey Lato Forsen. Now, the third accused, Richard Jakpa, is the one making all the news. The businessman, Richard Jakpa, has been under cross examination by the Attorney General the whole afternoon, making a pivotal moment in the ongoing ambulance trial. This follows the completion of cross examination by lawyers representing Dr. Lato Forsen, the first accused, last Thursday, June 13. Earlier, the court had admitted an audio recording into evidence capturing a conversation between Richard uh, Godfrey Dami, the Attorney General, and Richard Chapa, the third accused in the case. Now, Deputy uh, Attorney General Godfrey Chanyabwa says the cross-examination that, so, that, that, that ended today will continue on Thursday, uh, will provide a platform for them to tell their story. And Deputy Attorney General is here. Yeah, what do you make of you Richard Jaguar's testimony to today? You seen in the character of Richard Jaguar, saying that he was dismissed from the military. We are doing a cross examination, and that forms part of our cross examination. And what you, you just heard is what you just said. How, how difficult have you found Richard Jaguar to be in the witness box? You were in court. You witnessed it. Make your own judgment. At a point, DPP appeared to be frustrated with some of the answers Richard Jabka was giving. You were in your seat. How, how did you feel? She wasn't frustrated. She did a human's job. Now, from the answers from the uh, accused person, are you surprised? Especially so when they ask me one question, I'm talking about four, three, four police to answer. Are you surprised? I think you passed your own judgment. So the AG, AG has come back to court today. I saw him passing questions to the DPP, mentioning questions to the DPP to ask Jakpa, has he defied the directive by this trial judge and now he's taking, technically he's taking part of the ongoing trial, you would say? Let me make this correction. There was no directive from the trial judge. The advice. Exactly. Advice, you watch out the space, whether the AG who stand to conduct the case or who observe the proceedings. But technically, te right, just like you, to be in court, mm -hmm. observe proceedings, as to whether you conduct the case, leave the space unless you are. But technically, he is asking questions because he was passing questions to the DPP, dictating questions for her to ask Jakpa. That is technically taking he, part of he the case. He wasn't dictating questions to the DPP to ask. But if you are even a litigant in court, I mean, a subject matter of a certain litigation. Don't you reserve the right to be in court? Even if AG was the one being prosecuted, he has the right to be in court. And so today he came to court to observe proceedings, as you came to do. You, you, you but observe, it's beyond you observe ob observing. A by the uh, accused person, seeking to at least have the AG in what he wants to describe as a cross examination of a sort. Seeking to I, 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 I think he was properly answered by the. A presiding judge, and I'll make no further comment. You were in court and you, you heard the comments. From what you uh, said to the attorney general, do you feel the same that you love the opportunity to express and tell to Japan himself? You wait until you get to the end of the proceedings. If you come, you know. If you don't come, you also know. Is it the case of the state that Richard Jaffa, by the documents that he put before the court, did not give the entirety of the conversations? that went on between him and the Attorney General, and what his lawyers have been pushing is really not what happened. You were in court. Jakpa tendered some documents in respect of, of the chats. We also are going to tender the full complement of the chats. And this, that's what we are seeking to do. And, and you think the full complement is going to help your case? Wait until we get there. Because it appears he's now bringing in new stories that were not part of the of what they've tended into evidence don't be disturbed by that you handle everything in court thank you very much
And, and that was a reaction from the Attorney General's department, and that was the Deputy Attorney General, uh, Alfred Chuan Yabua, reaction after today's hearing, where the AG had the opportunity to cross-examine Richard Jakwa. The cross-examination will continue on Thursday. And I'm guessing that uh, Latif Idris was in court for us to, uh, to, uh, uh, today. So, Latif, so on Thursday, that will end everything because I know that the first accused, Dr. Atu Fawson, he's already closed his case. Yep. The case, has, the, the state has already closed his case. Yeah. It was left with uh, Japa to be cross-examined. So, after the cross-examination by the Attorney General on Thursday, will that bring everything to an end for the judge to now decide uh, you know, the, the merits and then pass judgment in the day that she will set? No. So what is going to happen after Rachel Japa? There is yet another person that will be cross-examined. And this is Big C, the, the Big C people. Okay. You know, they are the main the company, company that, that was to supply the with the government of Ghana to supply the ambulances. The ambulance. Rachel Japa is the local the agent. Uh -huh. So they will also be cross-examined. And so Rachel Jacques' cross-examination wouldn't and the matter. The trial. Okay. Yeah. Now, today, let's start from the onset. Before the court was called into section, we understand that the Deputy Attorney General had concerns with what he claims to be uh, somebody who had recorded uh, proceedings of last Thursday and was circulating the audio recording on WhatsApp. Tell us about it. Yeah, correct. So, this was when after Richard Jaka was made to mount the witness box to be cross-examined by the director of uh, public prosecution. And then Afetoy Abua rose and put before the trial judge that this is what he has found, that there's been a circulation of portion of Thursday's proceedings in court, which is being circulated on some- Audio. Audio, mm -hmm. which is being circulated on some WhatsApp platforms. And so he wanted the trial judge to take cognizance of that and then take the necessary action, if you like. Then she found it very problematic because she said it's prohibited for anyone to record the proceedings in court. In fact, the journalists who sit through proceedings have been told that it is not allowed, it is prohibited to record proceedings in court. So she, she found it to be problematic. Quickly, she called the leadership, and I'm talking about the lead counsel for uh, Case Lato Force in lead counsel for Richard Jaka and the prosecution into a conclave. I, and it took a little longer than we expected. Mm. We thought it was going to be like some 10 minutes meeting, but then it, it went on for like 20 minutes. Now, when they came back, the trial judge issued a warning and asked that national security should take up the issue, investigate, and get to the bottom of whoever recorded that proceedings. Mm -hmm. And once investigations is done, we know the outcome of it. It means if you are Obviously, found, you'll be in contempt of court. Exactly. You are going to be dealt with. She said, if it continues again, she will be forced to take additional stringent measures, which would be that the rest of the proceedings or the trial will be held in camera. Meaning only the, 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 the lawyers the one who is and their clients will be in court. Will be, will be in court to if it continues. Mm. But now she has asked National Security to take up any but, but, but did the Deputy Attorney General provide any name as to the one behind the circulation of this audio recording of the court proceedings on Thursday? For those of us who sat in open court who didn't join the conclave, we were unable to tell mm. whether or not at that meeting in chambers, the Deputy AG mentioned names or not. We do not know. Mm. All we know is that they went in there to verify the claim that had been made by the Deputy Attorney General, mm. after which the judge issued this directive for national security to investigate mm. and also issued a warning that if it continues, she will be left with no option than to, I mean, hold the rest of the proceedings in camera. And then before the cross-examination started, the Attorney General himself, Godfrey Diabuadame, walked into the court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but he didn't, he didn't do the cross-examination? Yes, he didn't do the cross-examination. Um, you know, for the last two, two sittings, mm. if I'm right, he, he didn't show up in right. court. And so there was this rumor that, okay, he has now taken the advice of this trial judge. Today, he showed up, took his seat, but then he didn't do the cross-examination, mm. even though he was conferring with the Deputy Attorney General, whilst the, the uh, Director of Public Prosecution was on her feet mm -hmm. questioning Richard Jaka. He didn't directly cross-examine, mm. I mean, the third accused. So now, let's get to the meat of the matter. I mean, the, the, the first issues that came up, one of them had to do with whether Japa was sacked 
from the Ghana Armed Forces and whether he failed his promotion exams. Exams, correct. So this question, you see the question he just asked. Mm. A, no, a, a yes or no answer, a that yes was required. A yes or no answer, it took four pages. And I think it's, it went even beyond four pages. Answer by Richard Jappa. So that was the question. Mr. Jackpa, you failed your promotion exams in 2000, I don't recall the exact year, I think it was 2000 or so. Mm. Then Richard Jackpa said that will be inaccurate. And then he went on and on with explanation. So let me just run us through mm. a, a bit of the explanation that he came up with. Uh, he mentioned to the court that he was commissioned into the Ghana Armed Forces in 1998 as a regular career corps intake 38 and was not dismissed, but was released honorably. Those were his words. Mm. He was released honorably by the Ghana Armed Forces. So he went back to when Adokufo was then Minister of Defense. Uh, Defense. And this will be President Kufo, President President Kufo's, Kufo's era. era. And that the minister had visited Sunyani, where he was in charge of a whole unit, a unit Richard Japa claims could only be headed by a major, someone who has the rank of a major mm. in the Ghana Army. He wasn't a major, but he was heading that unit. So, I mean, he, he was heading the, the 3BN as a commanding officer. Officer. A unit that's supposed to be headed by a major. No, no unit. Actually, a, a, a whole 3BN is the, the 3 Infantry Battalion exactly. based, in, based in Sunyane. Yeah. Yes. He made this case and many other cases to suggest to the prosecution that he is not that dumb to fail an exams organized by the Ghana Armed Forces. He quoted some exams he passed with a, a university in Pennsylvania and other foreign universities. He said he passed 20, he wrote 25 exams in two years and got over 97% in total. But the question was whether he failed the promotion the exams, exams at the Ghana Armed Forces. Then he makes the case that he was victimized because his father, because he's carrying the baggage of his father. Oh, who is his father? He says his father was part of the cadres who got former president Jerry John Rawlings from prison during the revolution. And so... That is when the, the late former President Rawlings, Rawlings was arrested after staging the coup d'etat. Exactly. That his father was the secretary of a unit, which for him was like the administrative body of the cadres. And so they led to the, I mean, release of former President Rawlings from prison. Mm -hmm. And so all the senior military officers who knew his father knew him. And so when he got into the army... He didn't get favors from any of the senior military officers who started uh, victimizing him right from day one when he got into the army. Mm. He went on to say that he was the best marksman of his intake, the unit. He was the best marksman. It means he was the one who, who was on top when it comes to weapons handling mm. and all of that. And so when President Jerry John Rawlings came to commission the unit, he asked, instructed that he, Richard Jappa, be sent to the Gonda barracks and not to uh, the base where they repair vehicles and armored vehicles mm. and all of that. that. That went contrary to what the military units had done right. with the deployment. Mm. And so when they said that this was an order from the former president, his superiors didn't like it because they found him to be a spy. Those were his words. Mm. They saw him as a spy who has been sent by the former president to come and investigates and reports their dealings at the unit. Mm. And so they didn't like him. And he went on and on and on to make the point that he didn't fail the exams, but then he was victimized mm. by the Ghana Armed Forces because of the baggage he carried of his father. And he also claims that when, when, when from, from, from former President Kufo uh, assumed power, he was transferred from Gonja Baras to, to 3BN in Sunyane. Yeah. Because of his father's links. Yeah. And from, from Sunyani, rather, to, she said, a coffee shop somewhere in the barracks mm. without any responsibility. So he was moved from Sunyani to, to the barracks. We, we, they didn't give him any assignment to come and do. So right. when he wakes up in the morning, he goes to the coffee shop, sits there all day long. And according to him, that was when his, his problems started. Mm. 
Because one day, whilst he was at the coffee shop, a cook came in and told him that he had found a lifeless body lying at the back of the, of the canteen. Mm. He went there and found out that it was the lifeless body of the bodyguard of the former CDS, JB Dankwa, mm. who was shot twice in the head. You know, it, it went was, on and it on. It was a winding testimony uh, uh, by Richard Jaffa, uh, which made it difficult. Just, just, for, just for a yes or no answer on the matter whether he was sacked yeah, or he filled the, the promotion. Exam. The pro Let's talk about his relationship with the Attorney General, uh, Godfrey Yabuadami. Yeah. So today, again, Richard Jaffa in open court told the court that his first telephone conversation with the Attorney General, Godfrey Yabuadami, was when he, Richard Jaffa, was detained at the ministry's police station and that he had satisfied all his bail conditions. Five million Ghana cities, four sureties want to be justified. But then he was being frustrated administratively. Those were his words. And so he called his cousin, who is a Supreme Court judge, and complained to him that this is the situation I find myself in. I have satisfied all the bail conditions, but I'm being frustrated. Is there a way you could help me? So then, according to Richard Jaffa, the Supreme Court judge, at the point he was engaging him, was on the bench. He was on a case. Mm. He had to recuse or get an excuse. And in his robe, according to Richard Jaffa, walked into the office of the Attorney General, Godfrey de Abouadami, and told him that this is what his cousin is going through. Is there a way he could help? Then This Supreme Court judge. Yeah. And in this case, already the name is out there. Yeah, Justice, Justice. Kulendi. Yes. Kulendi. yes. So he went to uh, the Attorney General's office and they told him that this is what Richard Jaffa is going through. Is there a way he could help? Mm. Then Richard Jaffa says that his cousin gave the phone to the Attorney General who engaged him on the telephone. Mm. That this is his predicament and that he wanted the Attorney General to help him. Then he said the Attorney General got him out to, to get the bill that he wanted. Mm. And so for him, that was the first telephone conversation he had with the Attorney General. Then he went on to challenge the Attorney General, who was sitting in the court, that if he's challenging what he, Richard Jaffa, was saying to mm -hmm. the court, then he should mount the witness box and be cross-examined so he will speak under oath and, and refuse whatever he, Richard Jaffa, was saying. Okay. Obviously, the judge wouldn't allow that to go because it's not part of procedure mm -hmm. in court to be passing some of these comments. comments. And then the, the f final question before I let you go. There was a question about why Richard Japa chose to highlight two test messages, WhatsApp test messages, when he has sent 68 test messages to the Attorney General. Yes, yeah, so according to the Director of Public Prosecution who was cross-examining Richard Japa, what they have in their possession shows that Richard Japa had sent the Attorney General 68 WhatsApp messages. Out of these 68, the Attorney General only responded to two or sent only two responses. Mm -hmm. Then, so she put that to Jaka and said, is that not so? Then Richard Jaka says, no, because some of the, out of the 68 messages he had sent to the Attorney General, mm -hmm. some were responses he was giving to the Attorney General based on face-to-face -face conversations they have had mm -hmm. prior to him sending the WhatsApp messages in response to those face-to-face -face conversations. So it will not be entirely accurate for the director of public prosecution to suggest to him that the AG had only responded to two out of the 68 messages that he, Richard Jaffa, has sent to him. All right, Latif, thank you very much for that. Uh, good job done uh, from the court today. And of course, you know that uh, again on, on Thursday, Richard Jaffa will again mounts the witness was to be cross-examined by the attorney general. It's unclear whether... Yes, yeah, yes, three more hours, yeah. and then of course uh, that that may obviously bring. So we'll, 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 we'll keep an eye on this story. On Thursday, we'll bring you more from the court and get reactions. Uh, of course, on top story on News Night on Joy News Prime, we'll have more reactions on the court or on matters that took place in the court today. Now let's move away from demonstration and ambulance trial, the court, and talk about what you undergo every day. Everybody eats. We're going to eat tonight. We're going to have dinner tonight. Now, cost of food is becoming so expensive. The reason that the ingredients themselves, they become so expensive. Now, households are being warned to brace up for continued increases in food prices, particularly tomatoes, until August, as the agricultural ministry interventions to mitigate escalating prices came too late. 
The ministry's late delivery of seas, fertilizers, irrigation facilities, the road efforts to mitigate the challenges, leaving consumers bearing the brunt of the price hikes, impacting households, individual budgets. Before we hear from the farmers, my colleague, Sam Fakpesu, paints a picture of the situation at Malamata Market. In recent weeks, consumers and vendors alike have noticed a significant increase in the cost of tomatoes. Just a few days ago, you could buy four pieces of tomatoes for 10 Ghana cities and two pieces for five Ghana cities. Today, the market price has changed, with the least price being 20 Ghana cities for four smaller pieces. Vendors at the Malam market report that a box of tomatoes is now selling for between 6,000 to 7,000 Ghana cities. They describe this year's surge in prices as outrageous. <laughs> Me here in Tosi, getting to 35 years now. This year, dear, you won't be there. It's too much. In Tosi, boy, there are 4,200, 4,500. But this year, you found Tosi 7,500, 7,800. Over time, we know, we did 7,000. We are now in 4,000, not 3,000. Actually, free. And now, by now, so I say, at least I'm on bread. Now, I'm on can be being found. If you are full, and I didn't know, and you're not going to see a tomato, so now this is here. If you grow my yard. You come here, then you can't buy anything. Chain, but in a day, I ban. You see, I wear a gun and shoes. If you come here, you come here, then you buy anything. Chain, but in a no. But this year, no, I've been see that. But in a, I be try to cram. If I'm find six thousand five hundred, we turn we me a four thousand two hundred. Every blessing, the NSA me come from. Me come in mobile money and some effort. We me turn me find seven thousand two hundred. Many vendors have reported a decrease in sales volume as consumers are buying less due to the higher prices. The prices have been attributed to several factors from transportation costs to inflation to seasonal inconsistencies. I bought 20 CDs, 40 CDs. I have four. 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 I it's not almost a banner, sir. My market, you want to see here. We say we turn 200 CDs, we're 100 CDs, we're 40 CDs, we're 20. The sound say, any part of the saying, when they bet me, I turn to 100 CDs, and some one year, and we're turn to 100 CDs, 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 we're turn to 100 Vendors are seeking government intervention to stabilize the prices of essential inputs. They also hope for better infrastructure support to reduce transportation costs. They say the entos of the media saying, Crawford better currency, Muntimito, Obiaya, and also to teach Mantus, the Sentos and the board, the Ufran Crano Johnny, the Sentos, my S. Sakai. And see a strabanis and committee member say, and come ye ye a binding yet to Sentos of four to send ye enough. Omu ye be now, Omut de ba may a tall gun hand, and can ye be a gun hand, committee my boy, and can toss you in Nanka Hadi and Napa, Nanka yet, Nanka yang yet, take a baby. Well, but there, there appears to be some explanation. President Kufuaro is advocating for peace in Ukraine, emphasizing that resolving the conflict is crucial to stabilizing food trade and easing the economic pressures caused by the war disruption of supply chain. The president spoke at the Ukraine Peace Summit in Switzerland. So the Russia-Ukraine conflict have reached far and wide, disrupting global trade, destabilizing markets, and exacerbating economic hardships for millions and millions of people. The African continent has been particularly hard hit. Our economies, already vulnerable and struggling to recover from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, have faced additional strains due to this conflict. The blockade of the Black Sea has led to severe shortages and skyrocketing food prices, 
which have precipitated a food security crisis across Africa, as many nations rely heavily on these imports to feed their populations. The cost of living has surged, and the specter of hunger and malnutrition looms large over our most vulnerable populations. In the face of such widespread suffering, it is imperative that we come together to chart a path towards peace. This summit offers a crucial platform for dialogue, enabling us to address the complexities of this conflict and work collaboratively towards a resolution. And of course, the food issues will not go away, and of course, and, and, and that's the reason why we we'll keep an eye on uh, for as long as it takes. But this morning, a member of the House of Laws in the United Kingdom, Lord Paul Yawatin, delivered a lecture at the 2024 Annual Leadership Lecture at the UPSA. Among others, he raised concerns about the many you know, problems plaguing our country and questioned the role of leadership in the problem. So what is the state of leadership in Ghana? How can we improve it for the benefits of the people? Join us for this discussion is engineer Dr. Achu Sobwe, President of the African Development Council. Sir, you're welcome. Thank you. So, I mean, the, the issue is about leadership. Yes. And whether we have the wrong people leading us. Right. I mean, uh, let, let's say charity begins. What is your assessment of the leaders that we have in the country? Thank you very much. And good evening to our viewers. Um, it's nice. Um, we had our own from UK. I mean, to come and educate us today that what we are missing mm. in the, I mean, in the, in the ingredients of economy of Ghana is leadership. Mm -hmm. Not the, I mean, not Ghana alone, mm. the continent Africa, leadership is what we are missing now. And how, what is leadership? Leadership just, uh, you don't need to have a PhD in leadership mm. before you lead. Leadership is just, let's say, this, this is a home we have. There is man and woman. You have the children. How do you look after these children so that you leave a legacy mm. with them when you are no more? That's simple. So Ghana is, let's take this room for Ghana. Mm -hmm. We have various natural resources beneath there. Mm -hmm. We have constitutions set up to protect this under the presidency. But at the moment, <laughs> None of this is in the hands of the, con I mean, of the country. Mm. It is in private hands. That is poor leadership. Mm. And then look, we have these kinds of leadership. We have the selfish one, and then we have the selfless leader. The likes of Kwame Nkrumah and others, they've, they've, they've shown to the world how selfless they are in their leadership mm. role. And the kind of one we're having now, where they're so selfish, they want to rule, and the end of the ruling, they buy the state, and they go home with it. It started during the, uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, how do you call it, um, Kufo's regime, mm -hmm. when uh, Jerry Rollins came out and established um, Ghana Telecom, under the chairmanship of Colonel, uh, I mean, Anirohu. And the Ghana Telecom grew, we have this um, uh, Telecom University. The only thing is when it was getting to the end of tenure, they say, okay, which one do we sell? They sold Ghana Telecom. We protested, Ghana protested. At the time, I quite remember the late Professor Tamils joined the protest, like the way it's happening today, joined the protest and said, look, when Ghana Telecom is sold, I will reverse it. Unfortunately, he could not reverse Ghana, the sale of Ghana Telecom. But, but, but we also know that diversification started way back from the Rawlinson's era when they started selling state, 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 state assets to the private hands under this diversification. So we've lived with this from regime to regime. Thank you very much. That particular policy that we call a structural adjustment program for developing countries is a program that pinned the developed, developing countries to the ground. How do you diversify state, I mean, enterprises? What, what that means is that they have anchored, you see, the kind of share a state holds in its enterprises is tantamount to anchoring the state to that. For mm -hmm. example, at the moment, Ghana barely has enough share in all its 
refund um, its uh, natural resources. Oh. We have less than maybe 55%, 5%, 10%. And the private sector has about 80 something percent. Mm. We have not anchored an economy into the country. And for that matter, our local currency becomes pure, I mean, pure paper, ordinary paper. So diversification, you, you do it with the brain. Mm. You do not sell more than, you know, 51%. Mm. The state must always be uh, in the driver's seat. Yeah. So my point was that, I mean, sell, selling seed as a, I mean, it, it has run through all regimes from maybe, maybe after increment up until now. That's what we have been, uh, we have been saddled with. But again, talking about leadership, I mean, people who have had the opportunity to lead this country, whether as president, as vice president, as members of parliament, as ministers of state, as chief executive of state-owned enterprises, as DCEs, you know, whatever capacity they find themselves in. These are qualified individuals who have, about 90% of us had, you know, experience of living abroad and understanding their system, and then they came back home to help. Would you say, I mean, how would you describe such crop of people, academic success, they are there, experience, they are there, yet, I mean, their work output is so telling that it is difficult to reconcile. Well, it's just simple. As I say, we have two broad categories. I have two broad categories of leadership. We have the selfish leaders and the selfless leaders. So in this country, how, where, where, where would you place the community? We have over 99% percent, uh, percent of uh, selfish leaders, as, as it is, as we can see. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Wild uh, state-owned enterprise, SNIT, which has been established by thinkers of the economy. If they were to be selling it when they are, uh, their tenure of office is over, will it be there for you to come and want to sell, tell, uh, I mean, majority share in it? That is selfish leadership. And those, we don't need them. And the only, I mean, thing that we can do to ensure such thing is cut off mm. is to make sure our constitution is restructured, mm -hmm. is reviewed to ensure a clause is inside the constitution, making sure that the capital punishment for sellers and buyers of state enterprise. Capital punishment. Punishment by firing squad. It is when I, I, it is I, I, in China. Are you not going to, to, to the stream? No, look at in China. But, but, but the people who bought these assets, they didn't, just, they didn't just grab them. They went through due process and they had it. The due process all they are leaders of the, the selfish leaders in the economy mm -hmm. and for that matter they can sell things to themselves so capital punishment it is in china let me tell you as far back as the late 80s china they realized that their number the population is is increasing astrom astronomically mm -hmm. what do they do to ensure these people are not you know one day going to kill them the leaders they say no until you have the brain capable of understanding engineering, applied science, you can never go near leadership. So for early 90s, all the leadership of China are all engineers. The current president of China is a chemical engineer. Mm. They have the brain well trained. They know that, look, the state, leaving things, legacy in the state is better than leaving everything, go away with everything, and then the next time the, t the state is poor. At the moment, there is enough capital in this state, but 99% of it resides in private poverty, uh, pro pocket. Therefore, what does that say of the people who elect such people into leadership? Yes, you have to, you know, I, this is an appeal to the electorate. When somebody is promising you, I am not trying to condemn anybody, mm. <laughs> but if somebody is promising you something that is scientifically, un, uh, I mean, impossible. For example, sending C to, to, to Kumasi, it's not possible. If we say we are going to have sky train. We should have people who dream. We should have people who dream yes. and they're able to bring it to fruition. Yes. I've been to Dubai before. Yes. Some part of Dubai was just, was just the sea. They realized that they were running out of land. Mm -hmm. They decided to convert part of the sea to land by a technology that pumps so much sand into the sea. Yeah. And now, when they did that, they created the Palm Jumeirah, yeah. which is now one of the most luxurious villas in the world. In that scenario, the universe and, is possible. Mm -hmm. You can fill whichever hole to whatever bedroom with whatever you get a land. But dredging the land, the earth, to send sea to a particular, I mean, I mean, it is. It you, said China, you said China decided that 
uh, then made a conscious effort and said, if I come into leadership, you must be able to think. Yes, everything and, and that's is exactly possible. what somebody is thinking and dreaming and, and saying that this can be possible. Yes, if we if, 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 if he's given the opportunity. I agree with you. In engineering, everything is possible, mm -hmm. right? But we have possibility percentage. So if let's say, hey, I say I'm going to we are going to construct rail rail line into the moon, it is possible. <laughs> but the percentage of the probability of its possibility mm -hmm. is very 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 meager. The same applies Dubai, to... Du, 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 Dubai 50 years ago was a small fishing community. Yes. 50, 50 years ago. Yes. In fact, at the time Ghana won independence, Dubai was nothing to write home about. It was a small fishing country. Less than 50 years yes. ago, it is now one of the go-to areas in the world. I agree with you. So what I mean is that everything is possible in engineering. Mm -hmm. With science, everything is possible. But you have to you know, grade, mm -hmm. categorize the probability of the feasibility. Of, of, of possibility. How to go so, about it. Exactly. Doctor, let me give you the opportunity to now tell me, uh, maybe give me five, five recommendations that as we move to, I mean, we are now under an, an IMF program. Yes. Everything looks like when we exit, we'll go back. Yes. Because if we will simply postpone the payment of our debt. We are, we, are, we, are, we are neck deep in economic distress. What will be your five point resolution for the kind of leadership we need, at least for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. Great. So we need leaders that will say, look, now let's add value to our raw material. We have crude oil. Let's, you know, uh, I mean, establish more refineries mm -hmm. so that we add value to the raw materials and export. Mm -hmm. Again, we have... Um, I've heard this like in every state of the, every state of the nation address. Yes. So adding value to raw materials. Exactly. That is what the people want to hear. Let me read to them. They will vote for me. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, they are going to borrow, share, and leave. So the people now must now know that those who are reading it, what is their level of education? Mm -hmm. Recently, it was on the debt that a debt passport is more important, or important than the PhD. PhD. Yes, I do not blame the gentleman. Reason being that I am a PhD, PhD role, right. holder in engineering. But those of my colleagues who could not graduate with me are now in political position. Who, they did not have the degree at the time, mm -hmm. but now appointed mm -hmm. as CEOs and ministers. And, and they, they run down the, the state's own enterprises. All right? So me being uh, uh, the person who has the knowledge, because I am deemed to be maybe a part of political something or not or whatever, I'm not close to them. I'm not appointed. The next time, if you have PhD, how are they going to use it for? Because the one who did not have it is now riding in what? Land cruisers and That's what the man trying to say. He's not undermining the PhD is very important. Mm. But in Ghana, they are not making use of the brain. They are interested in football. As it is now, they say Ghana is broke. We are, play, we are playing football with our money. That is where we should reduce playing wastage in the system. Where do we do this wastage? As an application of science and technology, let's go into industrialization, let's add value to our raw materials, that is the way forward. Then the next is that, let's reduce the wastage in governance administration. Look, Ghana, can, uh, we have uh, 10 regions, now we made it 16. 16, it must be reversed to 10. And then equal MPs is allocated to each region. So if you say 10 MPs for all the 10 regions, making 100 MPs. That, that, that would mean amending the constitution. Because the yes. Constitution the, reason, the reason is that um, MPs going to parliament to pass law is not population density dependent. Mm. It is district chief executives mm. that are population density dependent. So that we don't need 300 MPs to pass just a law for the nation. We need 300 whatever district chief executives mm. to take care of the people over there. But in parliament, we need, just need 100. When we reduce, uh, let's add the moment they are 70 something. When we just reduce it to 100, we save money for uh, the economy. That means 175 will go. Exactly. And then we move on. That is, but anything, that, as I'm speaking, I'm thinking they are going to add more, making it 300. It's a wastage and it is not good for economy like this. All right. Doctor, thank you very much for passing to. We'll have more time to digest into the issue of leadership in, in, in subsequent times on the program. Thank you. But before we go, residents of Wase, they are living in fear following the alleged murder of two nine security men in the municipality. The two incidents took place at different locations where one of them, 62-year-old Na Biangu Kobena, was allegedly slaughtered 
In the other incident which took place at Wa Model Basic School, a middle-aged man is alleged to have been murdered and suspected to have been burnt and buried in the school compound. Joy News, Upper West Region correspondent Rafiq Salam has more. Residents of Konta, who are of multiple ethnic background, woke up this morning to the shocking news of the alleged slaughter of one of their own, Na Biengo Kobena, the 62-year-old father of six, was found lying at the veranda of the satellite office for the West East District Education Office, where he works as a night security. The incident drew a large crowd of residents and passers-by to the scene. They stood quiet, many with grim and bearded tears, while they kept vigil over the dozens of police detectives searching the body of the deceased and the crime scene. Watching few years away from the scene of the crime, is the fourth son of the Alesle native of Keleu, Nabiang Ezekiel Kojo. He is here to come to terms with what transpired. He recounted his last meeting and words with his extrovert father. Yesterday, uh, Sunday was a Father's, a father's Day. They asked me about that and say, What celebration can we celebrate? So once he said, I say, Oh, what do you want? He asked me, He uh, want one uh, drink. So I bought a drink for him. I think that's the drink that I bought him, and that's all. So means that those were the, your last moment with your father? Of course. Okay, now he's been uh, stabbed to death. Uh, what do you want to be done? Holy God. And now... Also at the crime scene are members of the Upper West Region Security Council, led by the Upper West Region Minister, Stephen Yakubu who kept his store of the Sasala West District on the high twos following the incident. Residents of Quanta says they are shell-shocked about the incident and now lives in fear. Julius Yurunoba is the youth chief of Quanta. We, we have to live in fear. <clears throat> if this thing can happen to him, it can equally happen to anybody. Despite the expression of living in fear, Minister Stephen Yekubu has his assurance for the public. Assure the entire war people that uh, the security services will be patrolling, will do what they need to do to make sure that everyone is uh, safe. Ruling out of Quanta and to the War Model Junior High School is the next scene of the suspected murder of the school's night security man, Sidu Tarsong. Mama Hassan Tairu is the assistant headmaster of War Model Junior High School. We came early in the morning. Usually we come before he goes home, around 5. So today we got here and we saw his bicycle, including his pump. And we checked around to see whether we could find him. Unfortunately, we didn't find him. So we saw some traces of car, a car ties. So we followed up and checked behind our toilet and almost everywhere. Uh, some of the students said they have seen the car pass uh, in a certain direction. So we followed up and ended at around a nearby forest where we saw some drops of blood on it. So we saw that it was freshly dark uh, place with some burning of a, a mat and some clothing. The sea of people who throng to the scene of the crime are deeply worried to the marrow, wondering whether the issue of suspected murders of security men have clawed back to the community. They are simply asking one question whether the investigative report that were done by the security service has been thrown to the dogs. Mumu Jamil wants the security agencies, especially the police, to up the ante in their investigations and let the public know the outcome of their previous investigations. Events has happened. We have not heard anything. The, 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 the case has come to sleep. And for right now, how can we be rest assured that our security is safeguarded? The scene at the family house of Nabiyangu Kobna is enveloped in grief, emotion, and uncontrollable wailing. For now, there is nothing to stop them from grieving unless the perpetrators of the Carlos Act are arrested. Reporting for J News, Rafik Salam. Wa. Ha. Ha. Ha.
Very unfortunate development there in WA, and that was Rafik Salah. Well, that's our show for today, folks. For more service, log on to our website, myjoonline.com. Sorry, so myjoonline.com. For tester injured as police deploy pepper spray, tear gas, and hand off our hotel's demo. The other stories a two uh, ambulance case investigate audio recording of proceedings called the Red National Security. Well, folks, that's our show for today. We are back tomorrow, same time, the midweek edition of the polls. Until then, whatever you are up to in the hours ahead, I do hope it's profitable. My name is Elton Grobe. Have a good evening and take care.